banani kamanguno sipo welcome back to my channel today's video is going to be our very first episode in the ask dr nosi series really excited about the series because i get to share two of my passions my passion for medicine and my passion for content creation so about a week ago about a week ago i announced on my instagram that i was going to do the series and i asked you guys to ask a few questions and i wanted to start with feminine health and gynecology and that's what i asked you guys to send three questions about you send through a lot of questions about feminine health and gynecology so thank you so much for all of your questions i appreciate them so much i'm really still hoping i can make this a one part video if it's going to be too many questions i will split it into two but it will come one after the other so it's not one very very long video so today we're discussing feminine health feminine anatomy we're discussing sex we're discussing pregnancy abortions all those questions periods too that you guys asked in my dms i'll be answering for you guys today so if you're interested in asking me dr nosi some questions or i guess hearing the answer that i have to the questions that other people ask me if you ask nothing then do keep watching thank you so much for supporting my channel but until the next clip i love you all so so much and god ever stay blessing you so I'm just going to go through the questions on my phone, answer them in the order that I got them on Instagram. I'll try to keep the answers as short and comprehensive as possible. If you do feel like your question wasn't answered as well as you would have liked it to, or if you'd like a more extensive answer, do DM me and I'll definitely answer you on the socials and not necessarily in another separate video. So the first question that I got is, is it normal to bleed non-stop over months? I'm on Depo by the way. So Depo, so that we first know what it is, is an injectable form of contraception. So we have two ones that we use very commonly. We use Depo-Provera, which is the one that she's more likely on. And then we also have Norethisterone, which is another version that we use. So Depo-Provera is a three-monthly injection. And then Norethisterone is a two-monthly injection. That one we use more commonly for the younger generation or the younger population. And then Depo-Provera for our older um middle age to older women we use depo provera so with the depo it's a progesterone or sometimes combination injection but the side effect or one of the main side effects that we don't really necessarily advise patients on as much as we should is that you can have some significant bleeding with the depo especially in the beginning of you using the depo so it's just a common side effect that does happen you will sometimes get heavier bleeding prolonged bleeding or for instance bleed for a few months a month or two and then it should subsequently eventually stop and then after that your period stop on the depot so it's not something that lasts forever however it is a common side effect in the beginning when you start using your depot so it's nothing to worry about at the moment necessarily you shouldn't be bleeding for like five six seven months that would be concerning but in the beginning we're not worried about it because it's just a common side effect especially if you're going to use injectable contraceptives the next question that I got is, do birth control pills help reduce period pains? And the answer to this question is a resounding yes. Birth control pills do two things. They help regulate your cycles because of the hormones that are in them that balance your hormones in your body to try and regulate your cycles, which makes you bleed less. And it should also help your cycle come more regularly. And another thing that we use them for, especially the ones that have estrogens in them, is that they help reduce period pains during your period cycle. So if you're someone who has dysmenorrhea, which is what we call basically painful uncomfortable periods then you would benefit for birth, from birth control pills um it also depends on the type like i mentioned it should be one that has an estrogen in it which will help with the periods a lot and will also help with the heavy bleeding as well so if you are experiencing period pains and you've been looking around for things to try help and the NSAIDs or the painkillers are not really working really well for you and you have an irregular cycle then uh, contraceptives, oral ones especially, would be a very good thing to consider um, to help regulate your cycle and also to help bring down the amount of discomfort that you have during your period. The next question says, Hi doctor, I would like to ask, when during sex you get pain, does that mean that you have an STD or does it mean you need to get tested for an STD? So, if you're sexually active, first off, you should regularly be testing for HIV as well as other STDs and you should be mindful of what's going on down there so you do know if there's any change, so you know to go get tested and treated for STDs if you might have one. However, having discomfort during sex is not an isolation, a marker of having an STD. There are many different reasons why it might be uncomfortable or painful when you're having sex. Firstly, for instance, if you're a virgin and it's your first time, 
it's uncomfortable because your body hasn't adjusted to that specific process that being sex so with adjustment that you get less dis- less um, uncomfortable and less painful secondly could be something as simple as your vagina is dry so if your vagina is dry for different reasons uh, you could have low estrogen which could be causing the dryness in your vagina even emotional and mental things like not necessarily being sexually attracted to the partner that you're with can result in your vagina being dry which could make sex uncomfortable but then at the end of that spectrum where you'd have things like what we worry about that being sexual cervical excitation tenderness sorry where pretty much when you have like pid or you have a very severe um, std or you do have any infection down there you could also have discomfort and pain from that so you just need to be mindful of the other associated things that are happening around the time that you're having discomfort or pain during sex so if you're having that discomfort and it's painful but you also have a very purulent yellow white foul smelling discharge obviously you should probably be worried about an std if you can see that you have any bumps lumps things that you're not used to having down there that are growing that are new you should be worried about an std if accompanied with that you also have pain in your abdomen as well not just when you're having sex and this pain is there constantly you should also then be worried about an std but i just think generally people should just test very regularly because that's part of responsibly being sexually active so don't just leave it until you're worried about something to do something about it if you do think that um you have something to worry about it sure go see a doctor but make sure you test regularly otherwise the next question that I got is hey doctor are these vaginal soaps for example gynagot safe to use or should we just use water only down there so my opinion about this and I think this is a general consensus opinion is that your vagina is a self-cleaning organ and it doesn't need anything else to assist it to keep it clean so if you have an issue where you have funny smells in your vagina you should be worried about your why you have the funny smell as opposed to go buying a fancy soap to get the smell away because your vagina isn't supposed to have a funny smell so maybe there's a bigger cause than just i need to wash with an intimate wash down there and the reason why intimate washes are not really preferred or just anything except for water is not really preferred is because your vagina has a pH that it maintains and in your body just generally you have good bacteria and you have bad bacteria and in your vagina specifically there's a certain pH that your vagina has to be at to make sure that the good bacteria stays alive and the bad bacteria doesn't thrive and that's why when people use soap use washes they end up getting yeast infections really often and the yeast infections are pretty much just from that soap or that wash or that douche that being vinegar and water that people um, commonly use uh, killing all the bad back the good bacteria sorry that's in your vagina because it can't survive at that low pH and then letting the bad bacteria that being the yeast or the fungus thrive in your vagina and then you get candidiasis so it's really just better for you to use water but if you're having any issues with having irregular smells down there then you need to find the root cause of why you're having those irregular smells you might be having for instance an std that you don't know about that you haven't treated or something else that you need to worry about so don't rush to get the gynecard or whatever other intimate washes that there are out there maybe try to solve the problem that's causing the fishy smell because another thing that causes fishy smells is another um well not necessarily an sti actually not even not necessarily it's not an sti at all um but bacterial vaginosis which also has a lot to do with irregulation of um, ph in your body and sometimes people can have that chronically and that gives your vagina a very fishy smell so if your vagina is smelling like fish you really might might just be suffering from bacterial vaginosis so it's better to try find the cause of the irregular smells or the cause of what's causing the itchiness the discomfort and all of those things as opposed to running to intimate washes because your body doesn't need them and you'd actually just do better without them so the next question says i have recurring bacterial vaginosis thing that i was just mentioning now i've been to countless gynecologists general practitioners i've tried flagyl metronidazole v6 creams uh, gels pills fluconazole xenox injections but as soon as i get my period it comes back so hmm. uh firstly i really wouldn't have like another treatment for this specific question or rather uh, another miracle thing that she can use for the specific condition because in this question she's included all the first line things that we use for bacterial vaginosis i will however do some research for you and i'll try look around and find around to see if there's anything different that i can suggest and i'll definitely message you directly to give you like 
a specific answer to your question however i do want to highlight that it's important to note that she's saying around her period she feels like the bacterial vaginosis comes back but the situation there might be that the bacterial vaginosis never went away the thing is when you have sex right with bacterial vaginosis um semen or sperm is alkalotic so it's very basic and it's not acidic so when you have sex and especially if you're having unprotected sex where the vaginal secretions do get in contact with the sperm or the semen the reason why it seems like the bv comes back is because that heightens the smell of bacterial vaginosis and that reaction of the alkalotic uh, fluids from the male and the acidic fluids from the female make the smell that very fishy smell come out even more prominently so it might just be um, bacterial vaginosis that's always been there that never goes away that just peeks its head and reminds you that it's there when you have sex so it's not necessarily maybe a recurrence but it might just be um or not might just be it is just the um specific situation that heightens the presence of the bacterial vaginosis being there however i'll look for any other treatments that maybe you can try and see if i can find them for you but for those of you that are having sex and are having this fishy smile after sex do maybe think and worry about having bacterial vaginosis and go get that checked out the next question says, is it possible to see if a woman is a virgin or not? If not, then how do our traditional doctors see? Okay, so uh, it is possible to see if someone's a virgin, but like, it's a very flimsy way to see, but it is possible. So um, women have what is called a hymen, right? And this hymen is very different in shape. You have like complete imperforate hymens with just one solid uh, film of tissue. You have some crescenteric ones. You have some perforated ones. They're different types of hymens that people can have. And having a hymen there, especially if it's crescenteric, for instance, it might not necessarily tear during someone's first sexual, sexual encounter, second or third. So someone might still have a hymen that's intact even though they've had sex before the same way that um, someone might never have had sex but have a hymen that's not intact because some physical activity can also result in your hymen tearing for instance people who are gymnasts people who are like intense athletes they can have their hymens tearing or breaking without having sex so there is a way to see if there's someone who has a very intact like for instance a solidly closed hymen then you can probably be sure that they've never had sex before but it's not a very accurate way of testing and that is how they test to see because if you open someone's vaginal cavity and look all the way up there you can see the hymen there so that's probably how traditional doctors see if someone is a virgin or not because if they look up there and that hymen looks like it's intact and it's not broken or torn then they would assume that that person is a virgin and if it's disturbed then they'd assume that that person is not but it's not a very accurate way of testing because there are different reasons why that hymen can be intact or not intact the next question that i got here is Please cover the fibro topic. I've noticed most women don't know what causes it. So fibroids are a very, very important topic, especially among the black population. Black women don't necessarily get the cancers very often, except for cervical cancer, but they get the fibroids really, really often. So if you're black and you're having really heavy irregular periods, you're having discharge that you don't understand, you're having abdominal pain that you don't understand, please go get checked out because if it's fibroids, you need to make sure that you catch it and treat it early. So what are fibroids? Fibroids are basically masses that grow in your uterus. So they can grow on the inside of your uterus, that being your endometrium. They can grow in the muscle layer of your uterus, that being your my myometrium. They can grow in the covering layer of your uterus, that being the serosa, and they can be attached to your uterus um, with the stalk, that being like a pedunculated um, fibroid so it's really important to understand that fibroids are basically caused by estrogen estrogen is what makes fibroids grow that's pretty much their grow juice their booty juice is estrogen so anything that increases estrogen in your body is going to make those fibroids grow so for instance I'm gonna give a few examples if you are overweight obesity puts people at risk very very high risk of fibroids because in that fat or that lipid tissue there's conversion of estrogens and then that generally increases the estrogen in your body and then that results in you developing fibroids especially if you're prone to having them so being obese is a very very big risk factor for um, fibroids so if you are at a weight that is way above your bmi or where you should be 
please do maybe try considering losing weight especially if you have a family history or if you're prone to fibroids that brings me to the second thing where family history is really 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 important so if you have a long line of family history with most things um, where people in your family have fibroids then you should be worried that you might get them too and you should avoid estrogenic things so that you don't get um, fibroids as well another thing that can cause fibroids is supplements so um, not estrogen supplements necessarily but estrogen hormones so if you're taking estrogen hormones for anything that can definitely cause you to get fibroids contraceptives as well can also predispose you to um, getting fibroids especially the ones that are high in estrogen and then pregnancy itself doesn't necessarily cause fibroids but it can change the nature of those fibroids where you've always had fibroids but now pregnancy causes red degeneration where pretty much the fibroids get starved of blood and then they start to bleed and then they can cause significant pain in pregnancy so those are the main things that um, i think are important but i think what's more important is the symptoms that you need to look out for if you're um, worried about having fibroids would be if you're having any discharge itchiness that you're worried about that you don't understand uh, and that you've had for a very long time definitely do get checked out because that could be fibroids the second thing is if you're having lower abdominal pain or just abdominal pain that's also just constantly there comes and goes maybe worse with your cycle you don't really understand it do go get that checked out because you could have cysts or you could have fibroids so that's really really important as well um, and if you have a mass that you're feeling in your abdomen that you're also not understanding that's growing keeps getting bigger your belly's maybe just not looking the size that it should be looking even if you're gymming exercising and there's something actually in there do go get that checked out because those could be fibroids as well so those are the main things to look out but that's a really important question and like i said if you're black please make sure that you regularly get screened for fibroids and that you make sure that you don't have them because the consequences of them can be quite dire as i mentioned they grow in your uterus so they can overgrow your uterus so much that they cause menorrhagia where you just have heavy heavy really bad painful periods and they can go as far as causing infertility because if your uterus is overgrown with fibroids there obviously isn't space for a baby to grow so it's really really important to make sure that you don't have them and that if you do we catch them early and we manage them early the next question is can one's libido disappear at 22 i used to be easily aroused now that's not the case so uh, sex is a very multifactorial, multi-dimensional thing it's not just all about the vagina so wanting to have sex starts in here it has to do with this and it has to do with your body and the vagina and it has to do with the person or the people around you so if you're not attracted to your partner right for any reason he's too short he's too small for whatever reason that can definitely affect your sex drive because then you're not keen to want to have sex with that person but that's a mental thing not necessarily a physical thing so then that translates to the rest of your body you're not going to get aroused you're not going to get wet because you're not attracted to the person then your state of mind is also a big big um, game player in sex if you're depressed if you're unhappy if you're stressed you're less likely to want to have sex during that time so that's obviously going to affect your libido and it's going to affect your sex drive and then just the physicality of it all if you're not feeling physically attractive if you feel like you're not at your best then you're also less likely to want to have sex but i can assure you that it's very very unlikely that you've reached your sexual peak at 22 and you've completely lost your sex drive with women it typically is late 30s to 40s where um your sex drive now starts to dip but you peak at around 35 so 22 is way out of that range so i think it's more a multifactorial thing that's affecting your sex drive and your libido as opposed to a physical you've reached your peak and that's pretty much it for the rest of your life no baby girl you just need to look around you figure out what the issue is fix that and i'm sure you'll be a-okay the next question is is it safe to lighten dark marks around the vulva and well i don't know how you necessarily be doing that i'm assuming this is obviously in relation to like ingrown hairs and all of those things that i suffer from i get them all the time and they're really really annoying and obviously when you pick at them or when you pop them when they make um like little bumps uh that leaves dark marks but i don't think like anything can go inside like you can't be putting any lightning things inside your vulva on the skin around it yes sure um i'm not even too sure what you'd be using to lighten your vulva i'd hope that whatever it is it's very safe to use but i don't think it's a good idea to go like all the way down there where it's really close to your labia because then if that goes inside and then that's not very um 
agreeable with your vagina or it's not for internal use and it's only for external use then you might have consequences that you might not be very happy to live with so um as long as it's safe and as long as it's staying maybe like i guess around the bikini area i suppose then that's okay and also depending on the agents that you that you're using i suppose that's okay but i definitely wouldn't advise anybody to go all the way down to their labia and go too close to their vagina because that just sounds like a bad idea but i don't think it's necessarily completely unsafe to try get um, rid of the dark marks that you have around your vagina because everybody wants to have a nice looking vagina i mean it's a thing so i can definitely understand why but just be safe about it the next question is hi dr norsi does termination jeopardize your chances of having kids in the future so the answer to this question is yes and no so it depends on how you do your termination was this a safe termination or an unsafe termination? When you terminate your pregnancy, is this an early termination or a late termination? Um, and the mechanism or the method that they use to do the termination. These are all things that are really, really important. So if it's an early termination where you just take a pull and it's a little tiny thing that comes out, that has a very lower chance of affecting or jeopardizing your um potential for future pregnancies as you can imagine because that pretty much just aborts a very tiny pregnancy follows your body's natural processes of expelling it and that's pretty much the be all and end of it and if anything does get left behind and you need to have a manual evacuation we just curatage the inside of your uterus to try to get that out and that's pretty much the end of that however that process of manual evacuation even though it might not be necessarily the end of the spectrum as um where you go for an operative evacuation of your uterus that obviously because we scrape around your uterus does cause some micro traumas to the uterus um and that can cause um what are these things called i just need to remember that can cause adhesions in your uterus so that is something that can be a, com a complication of having an mva done so in terms of implanting of the pregnancy at a future date when you try to get pregnant in the future this could impact on the ability of your pregnancy to implant very effectively but even this is very very minimal so it's not like an extreme oh my gosh if you've had an mva you're never going to get pregnant again we've had patients who literally have had an mva in january and they were back pregnant in june so it's not a very absolute thing it's like one of those one in a hundred thousand sort of things that happens however that is one of the things that we should be warning you about if you have a manual evacuation that it might affect your um ability to have uh pregnancies or successful pregnancies in the future however it's not a very high risk but if you're now aborting at a later stage so this is bigger babies greater than 20 weeks three month old babies this is a very very big baby and as you can imagine the procedure of trying to get that baby out of your uterus is obviously a lot more traumatic than a little ball at six weeks so that has a higher risk of um impacting on your future pregnancies than an earlier termination so termination of pregnancy doesn't mean you'll never have babies in the future but obviously the more often you do it especially if it involves the manual evacuation and the later that you do it then it can um, affect implantation of your pregnancies and can affect future pregnancies but that doesn't mean that that people shouldn't terminate if for whatever reason they feel that they should um, but it's just something to be mindful of that it can cause some risks in the future especially if it gets to the point where you need to be evacuated but just simply using the pill very low chance of it affecting your future pregnancies the next question is can you get hiv from oral sex so basically what this question is about is the transmissibility of hiv so hiv transmission is a game play between the infected person their viral load and whether or not they're on treatment and then the susceptibility of the person who is hiv negative who is their counterpart in this engagement so if you're a person who's hiv positive currently not on treatment you have a very very high viral load meaning your transmissibility at that time is very very high so you are very ready and able to give someone hiv during your period of high viral load so high transmissibility so if you're going to have oral sex with somebody who has a very high viral load who's very high in transmissibility then your chances of getting hiv are much much higher however if the individual that is hiv positive 
is on their treatment is taking their medication and thus has a very very low viral load we would like it to be lower than detectable limits then that person is much less likely to give the hiv negative person hiv because they're not very transmissible at the time and the susceptibility of the person who's on the receiving end who's hiv negative is if there's anything that's making you immunocompromised if there's anything for instance since we're talking about oral sex if in your mouth let's say you were brushing your teeth and now you have a cuts in your mouth that you didn't know about and you didn't notice and you're giving oral sex then obviously your susceptibility during that time would be higher than it would be if you had no open sores in your mouth so it's just a gameplay between susceptibility and the person who's infected's treatment and their viral load situation at the time so it is still really important to practice safe sex even if you are a couple where the one person is hiv positive and one is hiv negative it's not something that um people shouldn't do or something that's impossible to do hiv treatment is very very effective especially when it's taken regularly and it's taken appropriately and when people are lower than detectable limits or ldl then they can honestly live their lives like anybody else can the same way that someone who is pregnant who has hiv as long as they take their antiretrovirals during their time of their pregnancy is at a very very low risk of transmitting hiv to their baby so the vertical transmission level is low because of the arvs and the mother being lower than detectable limit so as long as your partner is on their medication taking the medication going for their viral load checks regularly and you're also taking the appropriate measures to keep yourself protected then there should be no issues with the counterpart of an hiv positive person and an hiv negative person in any sexual situation the next question is is it possible for an sti wart specifically left untreated to go away on its own the answer to this question is a resounding no your genital warts are not going to go away on their own if you just do nothing they're just going to grow so um the organism that causes genital warts um is an organism that obviously just continues to grow and thrive if it grows untreated the same thing with any other sti so it's not just going to flush out of your system on its own and go away so if you do leave it untreated then those warts are just going to continue to grow and the problem with warts is that they don't just grow on the outside but they can also grow on the inside of your vagina so if you do have any warts especially if you catch them early just go to your local clinic go to the hospital get some potophyll and cream it's not that dramatic especially if you catch them early you just put the cream on them dies off those warts they fall off if you let them grow too much and they become overgrown then it starts requiring more aggressive methods of treatment that being surgery laser they need to cut them off they need to burn them off it just gets too dramatic and then it also causes problems when you get pregnant because now those warts can obstruct your introitus so now it's difficult for childbirth and then now you're having cesarean sections because you've got too many warts so don't leave your warts untreated do go get them treated especially if you're catching them early just go to the clinic go to the hospital get some cream and that will sort you out so they're not going to go away on their own